this is Jessica Kalinowski, and this is week four in using information effectively in philosophy. This week we had to um, do a reading on the Kabil house, and it's basically structured in two different sections. Um, the first half is the light side, and the second half is the dark side. And um, the light side is often, or it actually always is, of, on higher ground than the dark side. Um, and it's the first place that you walk into when you enter the house past the threshold. Um, the two sections represent the virtues uh, and symbols of the two different sexes. So the light half is representative representative <laughs> of um, the male sex. It is um, it basically. Um, the men are seen to have a higher and pure light, um, and the men go out in the field to produce, so when they leave, they leave in, they, in the light. So they're always into the light, which provides, um, like the sun provides sustenance um, in the production of food. And the second half, um, the dark side, represents the, um, the darker, mutable, earthy, symbols um and nature of woman um like the genitalia the darker side is the woman's space and it's um usually dark and enclosed um and it's where they s store and consume most of the crops and um the um other produce um and the males, um, along with the different sides of the houses, the males and the females are also representative in religion versus magic. Um, since the men are the only ones allowed to go out um, and assemble, they are representative of religion because they go out and assemble in groups and can talk and converse and um, really theologize. Theor theorize, sorry. <laughs> um, and the women are representative of magic because since they stay in the dark, their nature is often secretive and um, not really understood um, and a lot like magic. Um, and then there's a quote from the reading says, um, each of the two spaces can thus be defined as a uh, as the class of movements undergoing the same displacement, i.e. a semi-rotation with respect to the other, with the threshold, threshold constituting the axis of rotation. Um, and based on what we've learned about frames in the last class, um, last week's classes, this shows that um, with a shift in the frame um, from which you view um, from which you are looking, i.e. your orientation to the threshold of the house, um, really all depends on and affects how you will be seeing the space um, uh, as either light or dark. So if you're seeing from entering the house, the house will get uh, slowly darker. However, if you're leaving the house, it'll slowly get lighter and more towards the male-oriented side. Um, and then the second reading we had this week was about um, habitus. Um, it's basically, um, it can be defined as a generative principle of regulated improvisations that produce practices which tend to reproduce the regularities imminent in the objective conditions. Um, and then another definition that we need to make in this definition <laughs> is of objective conditions, and they can be defined as the instantaneous sum of the stimuli. Um, the, practice, the, <laughs> the practices produced cannot be directly defined, uh, deduced from either the objective conditions or the general principle of the habitus. So basically, what that all means is that a habitus is a nonlinear system, and the um, the practices um, and the objective um, conditions 
all constitute this nonlinear system. However, um, the uh, the meaning of the practices is greater than the sum of the objective conditions and the basic principle that defines them. Um, it can only be analyzed by looking at the structure of said practices or of the frame of the system in other phrases in other words um, and then another thing that the article told us was that habitas uh, produces a common sense world the past actions of the individual and the collective combine combine and are stored in the unconscious um, which then rules on how uh, an individual will react to any new situation and basically says that um, the past, um, the unconscious stores what we have learned and what others have learned from the past and bases all new situations on said experiences and so really new experiences really aren't that new. Um, and the common sense world becomes a homogeny that allows for practices and works to be immediately foreseeable, which then be can be taken for granted. So basically, um, because of the ability for the unconscious to be a collective uh, across multiple individuals, it can be homogenized, basically grouped together. Um, and with this and the fact that many new encounters are just regenerations of old count old encounters we can basically say that we can predict what will happen um, and with this known prediction and often the verification of said predictions we can take for granted some um, phenomena and other instances that really um, could go wrong and could um, be taken for granted obviously and uh, my example of this is with pollination by bees um, we all know that bees are the main pollinator for plants in most countries um, and we take for granted what that really means uh, and in recent years we've seen how that can affect um, what we really have taken for granted because there is um, the, the populations of bees have been on a steady decline um, throughout the world and until recently we couldn't figure out what it was. We, ha we know now that it's a hive um, disease and we're looking for a cure. However, um, what would happen was entire hives would die out and um, when you start to think about what that means, it's really a huge deal because um, through pollination, new species of plants, or not new species of plants, but new plants can um, breed because the pollinators make the fruit, the flowers turn into fruits, which become seeds, which can um, be taken and planted into new trees. So not only will we have, um, we won't have new plants, we also don't have as much fruit or vegetables as we used to because we feed on what the plants make as um, evolutionary purposes to distribute their seeds. So without the, uh, the bees, we won't have as much fruits and vegetables, so that's not good. <laughs> and then um, another um, po point brought about by the homogeny of the habitats um, is that the human, uh, the, <laughs> the homogeny of different practices and the different meanings behind these practices, um, interpersonal relationships are never, um, in, are never except in appearance, individual to individual relationships, and that the truth of the interaction is never entirely contained in the interaction. So basically, saying that even though you're in um, having a conversation with someone or interacting with someone for the first time or about a new subject it really isn't all that new and there's a deeper meaning to this that people don't realize and then my other example for this is um, chimps grooming each other 
Um, on the surface, it just looks like they're grooming each other to keep their pelts clean. However, there is a huge social um, meaning behind this, as in there's a hierarchy um, in within the chimp society, and certain chips cannot groom other chimps because they're lower on the rung, and um, it also creates very uh, strong social and um, social connections between such chimps and often leads to friendships um, and other things that you don't really see on the surface um, from your frame of mind. So, <laughs> um, Habitas is related to um, the article about the Kabil house, basically saying that even though it's just a house, um, the orientation of the rooms and the meanings given to the symbols of each room really has a deeper connection to um, society and the social order than you than is what is on the surface. Okay. <laughs>